So welcome to today's podcast where I'm joined by Mr. Neil Schaefer. I'm sure he needs no introduction um, as speaker at many conferences all over the world. But thank you, Neil, for taking the time to, to come on and hopefully share some good tips and knowledge um, about your social media and, and everything else that you've done as well. I think you've, you've had quite an interesting progression throughout your, your life and hopefully we'll be able to get some good knowledge bombs from you today. But how are things? Where, where are you based right now, Neil? I am based in, well, as you can tell from my accent, I'm obviously not in the UK, but I am based in Southern California. So uh, literally in between Los Angeles and San Diego, there's a county called Orange County. We're famous for Disneyland, sort of in the heart. It's, it's actually a county that has 3 million people, so quite populous, but that's where I'm located. Ah, nice. I was out in at an event in Anaheim last year, which I yeah. don't think was too far. So nice place. I love the West Coast of America. I'm not going to say I love all of America. New York's too busy and uh, the people are crazy, but that side of the world is a really nice place. I really thoroughly enjoyed my my time out there. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know a bit about what you do, can you just give us a condensed, because I know you've got a, a, a long history, but a condensed um, bit of background of where you came from and what you're currently doing? Sure. So my background before social media, and when I say that, you know, I've been, I've been at this a long time, like yourself, Craig. I mean, you've been doing SEO since probably I was in diapers, but um, <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I was in B2B sales and biz dev in Asia. So yes, I, I speak Japanese and Chinese because I spent the first 15 years of my career actually in Japan. So times changed, got married, had a baby girl, came back to the United States had the Lehman Brothers crash, uh, sort of had to reinvent myself because American companies could just hire people on the ground in Asia to do their sales and biz dev, not have me do it. So that led me to getting really into a tool back then called LinkedIn, which nobody really saw as a business tool back in 2008 when I started to blog about it. And it's been an interesting journey as I began to blog and as I did a lot of local networking, uh, my wife was like, well, if you don't find a job, why don't you write a book? So I ended up writing a book on LinkedIn. This is back in 2009. And mm -hmm. it was a classic after I wrote the book, you know, speaking opportunities. It's like, well, will you buy copies of the book for, for a speaking fee? They're like, okay. And that led me in January of 2010 to just a bunch of local companies wanting help with their social media marketing. So, I mean, we didn't even call it that. You know, we didn't call it that by back then. It was like, we need help with social media, we just don't know what we don't know. Um, and, and perhaps many companies are still, you know, in that situation with SEO, right? But um, but yeah, that was 10 years ago. And since then, I mean, there's been a lot of pivots that the market has matured. There's obviously a lot more competition, but, you know, I continue to write books. I um, do a lot of speaking and that includes training. Uh, I also teach executives, you know, digital and social media marketing. I fly back to Dublin every year to teach at the Iris Management Institute actually there in Sandyford. I'm also uh, teaching at Rutgers Business School in New Jersey. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of consulting. I do some agency work. I'd say a lot of the consulting I do these days is what we would call fractional CMO because I really enjoy being embedded inside companies. And I find it's a really good combination of getting really, really deep experience with companies while I also do the speaking and the training and the writing of books. So, most recently, and Craig, I mean, the reason I reached out to you, I wrote a book on influencer marketing called The Age of Influence. And I've been really passionate about really spreading that message that digital influence is everywhere. And, you know, I believe that any business in any industry can tap into the concept. And just to give you a hint, Craig, I mean, you know, as a blogger, I get requests, and I'm sure you do as well, of people that want, you know, hey, yeah, I mean, these classic sort of link building strategies, right? And that is influencer marketing. The medium is text and it's a blog, but you're basically tapping into someone with bigger authority in order so that some of that authority goes your way and you get more influence. My requesting to be on your podcast was my influencer marketing for my book because you are an influencer, you're a content creator, you're a podcaster, you're on the top charts, and my being on your show is going to help expose my book to your audience. These are the, you know, everyone thinks of influencer marketing as just, you know, the Instagram, the TikTok, the B2C brand, 
the millennials, the Gen Zs, but it's really everywhere. And once you see it that way, you begin to uncover some powerful ideas as to how you can collaborate with other content creators to really push your business forward. So, and that's where we are today. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, really interesting um, how it all works and, and how some people are so naive and, and being able to piece it all together and, and do do the job properly or effectively. But, um, you know, that obviously leaves room for, for guys like yourself to go in and consult, train or whatever. Um, but going back to the LinkedIn um, thing, I wanted to touch a bit more on that because... I wasn't into it as early as you. Um, you know, I think, I can't, I can't remember the year, but I remember there was a great tool called SEO, eh, no, not SEO, Autopilot for LinkedIn by a guy called Scott Oxford or Oxford, eh, Oxford or something. I can't remember. But I think the tool still exists if that's what you were curious about. Um, but it was an amazing tool. The Because the, I had this perception, um, rightly or wrongly, that, um, back then, it might have been like 2011, 2012, that LinkedIn was for old men, that, you know, old businessmen that, you know, just do all the kind of networking crap and all that stuff. Um, now, I, I just had that in my head and I was like, forget it, forget it, forget it. Then I kept seeing this guy with his tool that automated the process and adding connections and viewing people's profiles and all that stuff. And very quickly... I don't know if you you used to remember, like in your niche, you used to get like a lead table, like you were number one, um, the most viewed SEO guy and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that, um, it was around about that time when I was doing it and uh, the amount of leads I got from LinkedIn just by using that tool was frightening, a frightening amount of leads. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that's probably why you jumped on the bandwagon, you know, way before me. But, how do you feel LinkedIn performs today compared to the way it was back then? Because I I, I think LinkedIn is, is kind of went backwards massively for me, especially. Um, but I'm maybe not using it as effectively because there was a lot of automation. Then LinkedIn caught up with it, banned the two, and yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm trying to post as much as I can, but it's kind of stagnating for me. So. Sure. So I, you know, there are tools that um, that are still available that do that same thing. So I, you know, as marketers, we love tools, right? We love shortcuts. We love automation. Those tools, I know, have gotten a lot of people banned from LinkedIn. So you really do need to be careful if you use them. Also, I think so many people have used those tools so often now that back then, when you just started, Craig, it was unique. But now whenever you get a LinkedIn invite that is personalized, it's almost like, okay, this is using a tool or <laughs> this person is just kind of trying to sell me something after we connect. Mm -hmm. And I think that over the last year, a lot of people on LinkedIn have woken up to that and therefore those tools do not become as effective, right? But as a social network, I mean, this is the thing I tell people, share, especially if you're in business, share something on your LinkedIn, share something on your Twitter, share something on your Facebook. And if you have a business page, I think that the results are even more varied, but generally speaking, the LinkedIn algorithm is definitely working in the favor of people these days. Mm -hmm. Compared to a Facebook, compared to a Twitter, you're probably gonna get more impressions and more clicks. And I look at it as supply demand, like any other social media. Facebook, there's just way too much supply and incredible demand. Instagram, there's incredible demand, less supply. So images tend to get a lot of engagement there. LinkedIn is sort of the same. There's incredible demand. Not every professional is like a blogger or post status updates, right? Mm -hmm. So I have seen content still today do very well there. Obviously, if you do videos, if you do photos, like any other social network, they perform better. But I think LinkedIn is still as powerful today. It's changed without a doubt, but I still think it's as powerful today because that's where the decision makers are. You still have the ability to engage with them, to connect them. And I, you know, LinkedIn still pleasantly surprises me when I reach out to people. Um, a sort of, you know, if if you reach out to people in an authentic way and you're always thinking what value can you provide them, uh, LinkedIn is an incredibly, you know, valuable platform. So if it's not working for you, then maybe it's, you know, like back in 2008, I already had like 20,000 connections, right? Mm -hmm. So I have 30,000 connections. But what I've done over time, Craig, is I've pruned them. I've realized that back in 2008 was when I was looking for a job, 
I was connecting with like headhunters, but they're not interested in my marketing content now. So I will regularly disconnect with people so that my content is seen in the profiles of the right people who then will actually engage with that content. I think that's critical because if you've been on LinkedIn for a few years and you know maybe you connected with the wrong people to begin with, you connected with a lot of like open networkers, people with lots of connections. I was the same. So I literally go through and, and prune, 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 and just increase the quality of my network, which increases the performance of my content. So on that subject, um, I was exactly like you, just connecting with anyone. Literally used to sit first thing in the morning, bang, 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 add everyone yeah, yeah. on the phone. Um, got to the 30,000 connection limit fairly quickly, which I'm still at just now. I need to delete people before I can add people. Me too. Um, is there a quick way of getting getting rid of people? Because it's one of my pet peeves with LinkedIn is you've got to go in and, and you know, it's, it's just not easy for us to do that. Is there a tool or is there something where we can get rid of those people? I, I have used one tool called Linked Helper, which has a remove connection part on it. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of... Uh, obviously, you can search for people like in recruitment, for example, um, and it just wipes people out. But that's as close as you can go. You know, it's yeah. not that good. So sometimes you are deleting people that you know that are in digital marketing recruitment that I'm friends with or whatever. So any other tips on that? Yeah, you know, um, I've never used Leadtail Pro for that. You know, in complete transparency, I've tried you know one of those tools before. I didn't think it worked very well. Like literally. It wasn't doing the actions that it said it was going to do. So it's like, okay, I'm just going to forget about it. I will say that those automation tools can be dangerous, but there are a lot of data scraping tools available. So if you know how data scraping tools, uh, I use something called Phantom Buster. So you could at least do a search and find the people. So what I find when I need to prune people is I'll just do like industry. Like I just want to prune everybody or country, anything that you can define in a search and find your first degree connections that are like 50, 100, 1,000, mm -hmm. then you can scrape that and then perhaps you can feed that into the to the Elitel Pro to make it more automated. So mm -hmm. that is, you know, I, like I said, I haven't used any tool to disconnect. I wait for like a trigger. When I get the 30,000, it's like, okay, and just this morning I did the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. I did a search in a certain industry um, and I went through 20 search results. And, you know, what I also do, Craig, is sometimes people change companies. And if I was going to automate this, I would lose touch with actual friends. Yeah. So there, there's something to be said for manually vetting. And what I do to manually vet Craig is I, I will click send message. And when you click send message, if you have a history of conversations or chatter with that person, it shows up there. Yeah. If you don't, then it's like, okay, safe to disconnect. So mm -hmm. unfortunately it takes time, but I think, you know, for me and you, if you're just doing it you know, once a week, once every other week, five or 10 minutes, it doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it is sort of a constant, the whole idea about LinkedIn is why would you disconnect from someone? Because it's a network of trusted relationships, right? So yeah. the outliers, obviously. <laughs> um, but no, LinkedIn uh, has, as I said, pr proven to be a great tool for me. One last question on the platform I do want to ask, and I've heard people talking about it and I need someone like yourself to just validate this in my head. So sometimes I'll go on to LinkedIn and I'll do a podcast like this, um, which I put out onto YouTube and whatnot. So I'll go on there saying, you know, hi guys, done the podcast with Neil, come and see what he's going to say about social media, and then put a link to my YouTube video on there. Is that a disaster? Because I'm taking people off of LinkedIn. Because um, I've heard people saying, put it in the first comment. I've heard people saying, you know, upload the video actually to LinkedIn itself and you'll get a lot more exposure. So would you, you know, what, what, what's your opinion on that? Both N natively upload and put any link in the first comment. Cool. Um, because yeah, I've seen it obviously back, you know, a few years ago when I used to do it, it got, you know, X amount of views. And now when I'm doing it, sometimes, you know, it's like 200 views, which is just a joke. Um, just be, But I get it. I get it. It makes sense. But I just wanted to hear someone who actually knows what they're talking about actually confirm that in my head. Um, <coughs> so moving on away from LinkedIn, you obviously have 
um, an impressive Twitter profile, which we'll come back to. Facebook, Instagram are also reasonably high. Pinterest is one that I want to touch on. It's not one that your typical digital marketer has a great um, following on. And I'm just curious to know how you get traction on there. You know, you've got fair, nearly 37,000 um, followers on Pinterest. And I've always felt it's a platform that I've never really utilised. Now, I do have one, got a very low amount of followers. I don't really post anything to it purely because I'm like, what is going to be interesting for in my industry to put on Pinterest? So obviously you're in a very, very similar, well, we're in digital marketing. It's the same industry. Yeah, yeah. So how are you getting traction on there? So all these platforms we talk about, I've been doing them for like 10 years, right? So first of all, sort of like influence and following doesn't come overnight. It, it takes time, as you know. It's just like, it, you know, the average uh, first page Google search result is like something written two or three years ago, right? It, all this takes time. Um, and, and Pinterest is no different. So what I found with Pinterest was because I focused uh, primarily on social media marketing, I need to figure out these platforms. So when I started out on Pinterest, I was looking for a reason to use it. And I do a lot of speaking. So I'd say, hey, all, everything I talked about is on this board. So then I realized, huh? So we have the concept of boards, which are like content categories. Uh, you know, if you have a blog with 10 or 20 different categories, these become boards. Mm -hmm. and, and Pinterest, like Twitter, well, Twitter, you still have engagement, what have you, but they're really search engines. And the founders of Pinterest will tell you it is not social media. It is, it is a, a network. It is a discovery engine to mm -hmm. find content that inspires you. And it's primarily visual content. So what most, you know, digital marketers fail to see is, you know, they probably aren't users of Pinterest themselves, right? It's like my podcasting got a lot better once I started listening to other podcasts. <laughs> um, before that, you just don't know. You think it's just another channel for your content marketing. So, you know, Pinterest is a few things. It's, um, it's obviously creating these boards and you can understand from an SEO perspective that whenever you pin something, you have an image with a title and a description. And the more that it matches the title and the description of your board, right? The more Pinterest sees it's relevant for that topic and the more it'll feed up that content for that topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I found with social, with, with digital marketing topics, I've done very well. In fact, Pinterest drives the second most traffic to my blog after Twitter, believe it or not, more than LinkedIn and Facebook. And the reason is it is the search engine. It's also because I've been there for a while. I have followed other people as well. And I share a lot of other people's content. So similar to Twitter, it's counterintuitive to a lot of digital marketers, but the more other people's content you share, the more you just get seen and be followed for that topic so that when you publish your own content, you get a little bit more juice for it. You get a, you already have a built-in audience. So with that in mind, I've done a lot of curating. And the great thing for digital marketers about Pinterest is there is one tool that rules above any other tool for Pinterest, a tool called Tailwind. And Tailwind will actually allow you to schedule pins to repeatedly publish on something they call a smart loop. So they're an official Pinterest partner. They tap directly in the Pinterest API. Pinterest themselves say it's totally okay to repeatedly pin the same pin. Mm -hmm. Just don't do it too often. Um, and, you know, I'd say on average, I pin a single pin to 10 different boards, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. On average, it goes to three or four months to go through one pin. Now, my blog, like your Craig's, yours, Craig, I mean, I have hundreds of blog posts, right? I have 170 podcast episodes that all have pins as well. So it's hundreds of pieces of content. And I have these, you know, the, these what Pinterest call, what a tailwind calls smart loops, everyday pinning stuff. So that's one side. On the boards on Pinterest, you also have something called group boards which are like-minded, it's like, Craig, hey, let's start a digital marketing board, or let's start an SEO board, and let's each share our content to it. And let's invite mm -hmm. other people from the industry. So you, so these were really popular a few years ago, not as effective today, um, but I still do pin to those boards. And by the way, I have a best of neilshafer.com board. I have a social media marketing board. And then I might have like a LinkedIn tips board. And when I post something related to LinkedIn, I'll post it to three different boards because some people follow some boards and not others. And it gives you additional opportunities for exposure. So you can quickly see, Craig, I on average post 45 to 50 pins a day and it's all automated. Okay. Wow. 
there's one more, and I'm basically teaching you the, the, the Pinterest marketing <laughs> tips all in five minutes here. There's one other piece, and this is all done through Tailwind. One other piece, which is something that Tailwind uh, brought to light, or I should say, you know, developed, is you've heard of Triber, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like a Triber for Pinterest. So it's basically Tailwind members that create tribes and different than Triber, which basically, well, I guess Triber is the same, but basically it's tribes where you share pins and you share each other's pins. And the idea is most tribes will say, you know, make sure that it, you know, if you're going to uh, submit a pin, make sure you share a pin. Yeah. And if you're a tribe manager, you get analytics. I have my own tribe. I have about 550 members. Um, it's called blogging and social media marketing pros if you're curious. But I will now curate 100% of the content I curate comes from my tribe or other tribes that I'm a member of. Mm -hmm. And I know that they're sharing my pins as well. And they get notified when I share their pins and vice versa. So that's how I fill out. You know, I'd say right now, um, 30 pins a day are from my smart loops and maybe mm -hmm. 15 pins a day are from the tribes. But now I have a completely automated system that over time generates a lot of traffic. And then, I mean, th the other side of it is you need to have a pin. It's, it's two by three. So, you know, 600 wide by 900 tall. It just like a YouTube thumbnail. It has to speak to the pinner. So mm -hmm. a title of blog post isn't always the right title. So there's a whole art to sort of what that image looks like. Now they have like story pins. They have video pins. So there's a lot of technical, like technical SEO, you can go far and, and, and try to optimize. But, you know, what I would do to get started is you need to have visuals. You need to have pins on your blog posts, mm -hmm. right? You need to create a link between a visual and your blog. Um, mm -hmm. And it needs to be in the Pinterest format. That would be the, if you're listening, that'd be the first thing I do. I'd set up my Pinterest boards. I'd start pinning. I would look into joining tribes. And as you join tribes and as you share other people's content, you begin to get ideas like, how do I visually create pins? How do I, you know, what sort of captions, what sort of content resonates? You can look at like the top performing pins per board for your analytics. And guess what? Most of my pins I created on Fiverr. I mean, this doesn't have to cost a lot of money to create a pretty good looking pin. So there you have it. I want you all to try that. It's like the 30 day Pinterest challenge. And I do believe over time, it's like SEO. It might take six months, it might take nine months. You might get lucky, it might take three months, but it doesn't have to take a lot of time once you get going. Yeah, I think does that, does that satisfy your curiosity, Craig? Yeah, well, what what I love doing now, uh, you know, I'm a big believer from an SEO point of view that uh, engagement signals is really important in terms of a ranking factor, and I think people should be utilising the likes of Pinterest where possible to be able to drive traffic to new blog posts or old blog posts or whatever. So, and, and you know you validate and saying that you know it's the second biggest driver of traffic to your blog basically says it all and, and i think a lot of seos are probably in the same boat as me where you've got to hold your hands up and say i've been a dick i've just ignored this and uh, there is a way of driving traffic and and stuff like that and i've i've heard people talking about tailwind and i absolutely love the fact that you know this can be automated because like you say all of us in this industry love a bit of automation so amazing yeah. amazing tips um <clears throat> next up uh, what i want to ask you about um obviously you do really well across all your social media channels um i've also noticed you know by googling your name you've got your knowledge graph you've got you know your twitter carousel you've got all of the, the things that you would need from a an SEO point of view, you know, all the kind of trigger points and clearly you know what you're doing in general with digital marketing. Um, but, you know, what, you know, you're not an actor. You're not, a, you know, a Hollywood superstar. So what I'd love to know is Twitter verification. How do you get that? Because, you know, you hear all these stories where you're just not noteworthy enough. We're not giving it to digital marketeers. We're not giving it to guys who speak on stage. I've literally banged everything. You know what? It's probably just an ego thing. I want that verification mark eh, because, you know, a few, a few other guys have got it. And I keep hitting a brick wall. So, you know, and, and I'm told by people, unless you're like a, a noteworthy character or a Hollywood superstar, you ain't getting it. So how do guys like yourself get it? Because I know, like yourself, you've got your Neil Patel, Brian Dean, 
and lots of other digital marketing guys have it. Now, I'm not saying they're not noteworthy. Speaking on stage, you know, <coughs> writing a book, all of these things are all really important. But is that all it was or is there more to it to get that? Because there's got to be loads of guys out there who are obsessed with social media verification. And is there an easy way for us to help ourselves along getting that? Yeah, so when I got verified, Twitter, I believe they recently reopened the verification process, but it was closed for many years. And when I got verified, a lot of people got verified. I think out of all the sites, I still can't get verified on Instagram, by the way. I mean, I'm only at like 15,000 followers, but um, we're, I've seen people with like two or 3,000 followers verified there, right? So I, I totally get you know the point. So I think that Twitter back then was the easiest to get verified on. And I think it's a matter of, you know, do you have a blog? Do you have a book? You know, are, do you appear, if someone wants to search your name, are you appearing on other sites uh, that are important? Um, I will say that I've actually been, Twitter's actually hired me to speak at their corporate headquarters um, on how marketers view Twitter and, and giving them advice. So that definitely, you know, helped in some way, I'm sure, of getting my name on their radar. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is that what I've found in general, so when I look at who, back then when I was looking at who was verified on Twitter, you'd see journalists with like a thousand followers that got verified, right? And then I'd see like agency, you know, agency CEOs that didn't have many followers that were verified as well. And when I dug into it, I believe that obviously any connection you have inside any of these social networks is going to help you, right? I, I don't think it alone can do it for you. But one thing that definitely helped was that as a marketing agency, I was managing Twitter ads. So I had a Twitter ad rep. Mm -hmm. And a Twitter ad rep is someone that I could actually, hey, do you know anything about the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, without a doubt, you know, I'd say if you want to get verified on any given network, you, you know, you, I think being an author, I'm not going to say it's a, it, you absolutely have to be an author, but I think it definitely helps uh, unless without a doubt you're seen as an authority in, you know, in, you know, Rand Fishkin, I don't think he's ever written a book, but he's clearly seen as an authority by, by anyone and everyone, right? Yeah. Uh, so unless you're in that situation, the book definitely helps. Um, but definitely if there's an ad rep, those are questions you can ask them, right? Because the ad reps just want to sell ads. Um, so, you know, they, they did not, I, I don't know if they influenced the decision or not, um, but, you know, it, it is an open verification process and people internally do need to look at these and do need to sort of manage them. And that might have also helped. Now I'm also verified. So that's my Twitter story. I'm also verified on Facebook and on Facebook, there was a guy who was already verified say, Neil, why aren't you verified yet? And I'm like, huh, how do I get verified? And it was actually a link that you could apply to that was dug. I don't even know the link today, but actually if you dig deep into Facebook help, Facebook FAQ, there was an actual link to apply for verification there that was very, very hard to find. Mm -hmm. And once I applied, it happened very quickly. Now, could it have been that because I was already verified on Twitter, it helped? Definitely. Um, but I think the same thing about being an author and what have you is, is very, very important. So, you know, I'd say if you want to get verified, put out a book, put out a book on Amazon, put out a free Kindle book, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to help. I don't have a Wikipedia page, but I'm sure that would help as well, without a doubt, if you, if, if you had one. Um, but those are the things that I would do. I, you know, I see so many people, Neil, like on Instagram, Neil, how do I get the blue tick mark? It's like, well, dude, I don't have it on Instagram myself. So don't ask me, but, <laughs> but people look for shortcuts and you know, you have a hundred followers. Why would you get verified? Why would a, any social network want to verify you? So, um, I, those are the things that I would think about, but definitely, you know, spend you, I think anybody who does Facebook ads will tell you that whenever they run into a problem, if they have a Facebook ads person that they work with things get resolved very, very quickly. So this would be another thing I would look into. Yeah. No, I've heard people say that before. And they've also come up with a figure. If you spend X amount of money advertising on these platforms, then you will get that mark as well, especially on Twitter. But I've also heard the flip side where there's guys out there saying, I can get you verified. It's 3,000 bucks. Yeah. And run away with your money. So be careful. I have looked massively into it and i was curious to get your take on it you know i think be you know one having a book but also having other pr clearly you've got pr from speaking and and you know whatever else you've done in your career um which also goes some way to proving that you are 
someone that's worth verifying and you're actually good at what you do. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to ask that question. But going on to um, your speaking side of things, I just want to touch on that. You know, you're, you're, when I go to your page on there, you know, you've got all your, your little lanyards and, and, and speaker badges there. How long have you been speaking for? And, you know, how, is that something, you know, how, because I do speak in myself, you know, and I know it's a hard slog, you know, people don't appreciate that, you you know, you're traveling, you're making slides and all that kind of stuff, you know, and you're speaking at, you're, you're spoken at a lot of events. I just, I'd be curious to know what, you know, possesses you to keep going and continue to do it. Is it payment? Is it education, helping people? Or something else. What you know? What's your take on that? Because obviously it, it becomes very, very tiring after a while, and you're just like, you know, is this worth it? <laughs> um, and I know it's great at the start when you're unknown and you're doing it to build your brand, but there must become a point where everyone knows Neil Schaefer. You know, do you have to do it as much as you you continue to to do it? So, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... In general, I think if you let your foot off the gas pedal, there's always people that want to grab your attention. So mm -hmm. if you don't keep doing it, you sort of lose authority. It's like, you know, with a blog, if you just stop blogging, over time your rankings are going to fall, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. there's always competition. Um, I am really passionate about what I do. I sort of think of myself as an educator. So I, you know, I, I, I love you know, I'm very much an outward facing, love meeting people type of person. So being on stage gives me the ability to do that. I'm not going to do it anywhere and everywhere. Uh, I do want to get compensated. And if I'm not compensated, there has to be some ROI for me. I'm not mm -hmm. just going to speak because if you wanted to speak every day at, at an event, you probably could. There's always events yeah. looking for speakers, right? Especially if you don't want to uh, charge money. So it has to be part of, you know, what you do. It's funny, Craig, because I have always my main business has been, you know, consulting, speaking. I don't sell products directly to people. I don't have like digital programs. Yeah, I have books, 20, 25 pounds. I mean, it's not, not a lot of money, right? So I'm not there speaking and like trying to sell books at the back of the room. It's not my style. I'm more of, and I mean, my approach to, you know, podcast interviews as well. I just want to share the information that I've learned working with companies and if you remember me and buy my book, awesome. If you end up becoming a CMO and want to hire me, awesome. Uh, but it's just it's just a natural process. It's just a natural PR process, right? Um, so, you know, if, on the other hand, I was trying to make sure I book business, events can be a great lead generator. We know that. And it's not to say I don't get leads, don't get business from speaking. I just don't expect to get it every time I speak. I look mm -hmm. at that as being something completely different. So, yeah, you got to enjoy it. I mean, it's like podcasting. If you don't enjoy it, you're going to, it's like blogging. If you don't enjoy it, you're going to stop doing it. So you get, and whatever niche, you know, you want to be known for, if you're not passionate, if you're just choosing a niche because it's trendy, you're not passionate about it, you're never going to continue. So I, I think speaking, you should continue. You don't have to, you know, speak 50 times a year. Like I did at my peak. Um, and these days, a lot of the speeches are virtual as you can imagine. Yeah. But, you know, with every opportunity, there's still people that don't know about me. There's still people that, I want to expose, you know, I want to expose my insights too. So yeah, it just it comes down to the passion, man. Yeah, I think for for me, obviously, I'm I'm very similar to you where I don't really sell anything. I can sell training courses, I can sell stuff like that, but I'm more of an affiliate marketer. I make my own money. Um, so speaking for me is, and I just wanted to hear again your view on it. I, you know, I love sharing. It's I'm passionate about SEO. Love meeting people, love the whole atmosphere around about the speaking circuit. But I think, uh, you know, you, you know what it's like. Some events don't want to compensate you for your knowledge, but they're selling tickets for big bucks. And that's what exactly what I've done is now, unless there's some kind of ROI for me, I have zero interest. And I wasn't sure if that was me being a, a douchebag or not. <laughs> by well, But there are, I mean, so the way I look at conferences, I, I sort of look at them three different ways, or I think there's three different types. There's corporate events, which are awesome. Pay the best, that's cream of the crop. You then have in the United States, at least a lot of professional association events, mm -hmm. association of, you know, whatever. And hey, let's bring in an SEO person. Let's bring in a LinkedIn person. Don't pay as much as corporations, but they pay decent. And there's a lot of them, right? 
So there are people that just speak at professional association events and they, they do very well. Then you have your industry events, like for the marketing industry. And these are events like Social Media Marketing World is one that I've been honored to speak every year at. These are events, they don't pay speakers. They don't need to pay speakers. In fact, some speakers would love to pay to get on stage. So mm -hmm. I have come to understand and appreciate and honor the fact that unless you are the one or two keynoters, you are not going to get paid to speak at a lot of these marketing conferences where so many people would pay to speak. Corporate yeah. sponsors pay to speak, right? So, and this goes the same for any, you know, famous digital marketing conference, what have you. So I don't expect to pay to, to, to uh, um, uh, you know, to, to be compensated. However, you know, if I have to fly out there, um, I expect that a minimum travel fees, uh, you know, it is going to be loss of business for a day or two. So if someone is going to reach out to you and ask for you to speak, there's a good chance you're going to be able to get compensated something for that, right? Um, but if you're reaching out and applying to speak, then you're at the bottom of the totem pole. You can't expect to get paid, um, especially if it's like a marketing industry event. So just just things that I've learned over the last decade of speaking. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right. You know, obviously, if you get your foot in the door, sometimes you, you just have to do it for free. But um, yeah, you, you can get compensated, get your flight and accommodation paid for in it. It certainly helps helps um, with all of that kind of stuff. But one other thing I wanted to ask you about speaking, you know, is that, you know, get into speaking, it seems like it was probably a natural progression for you, just given what you were doing, you just speak. It's the same as me. I've had no speaker training, no nothing. You know, basically was just thrust onto a stage and, and got better at it over time. Did you ever go and get any kind of speaker training or you know how to hold yourself on stage kind of training or is it all just make it up as you go along yeah um i have never been i've never gotten formal speaker training i've seen you know videos i've gotten feedback from organizers as to what they thought about my speech and yeah i it's you know i don't think you if you want to become a professional speaker it's one thing and there's definitely a science and an art to it without a doubt and i have full respect for people that have gone through the formal training that are too speed. And they probably look at me saying, who is this guy? Um, <laughs> but for me, it's less about, Hey, I want you to introduce yourself to the person next to you, shake their hand, ask them what their name is, ask them how you can help them. Uh, that's not, I'm not like that motivational speaker type. I'm there to, you know, inspire and provide insight and, and educate, right. And empower. So yeah. if, so for me, and I'm not to say the delivery is always important, right. Um, but for me, it, 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 it's more about that content. But what I realized over time is it's not just about a brain dump of your content. It's through storytelling and through building up drama um, that you can actually teach less and have bigger impact. And it's really about that transformation. So these are things I've picked up over time. But um, <coughs> excuse me, no, no formal training. But I do, you know, if, if you're not going to do well, you will get that feedback. And for those people, you know, doing it naturally may not be enough and you're, you're probably going to need more training. But I was very fortunate to have gotten this far with without the need for it. Yeah, though, I, 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 th I was hoping you would say that and you didn't go to speaker training. Um, <laughs> but it's nice to, to hear um, that that's the case. And I think you're right, 100% right. You know, we're not professionals because we are, you know, we hold a wealth of knowledge in, in what we do and, that can come come across really well, and obviously the passion and everything else, and and it stands you in good stead. And and I've never had any real complaint from me either. So um, I think you, you know you're 100 spot on with that. But finally, going on to the book writing thing, and obviously you've got books out there, and and, and you know you've obviously got your new book. Um, <coughs> First, I, I don't want to talk about your new book just yet. Um, book writing in general, um, you know, everyone in digital marketing will probably think, you know, after what you've said, you know, release a book, you know, it's an important thing to do. What is the process like, like really writing a book? You know, I've done Amazon Kindle books and, uh, you know, very easy, very simple, you know, got published, bang, bang, bang. That's easy. What you're doing is writing a real book, <laughs> you know, proper in-depth book. 
one of my pet peeves, or, or not pet peeves actually, probably one of my faults is being able to concentrate for long enough to write a book, you know, just having that dedication. So, you know, is there any advice that you could give people who are writing a book? Like, have you got a ghostwriter, you know, or do you, can, is, is there a way we can maybe put it into a, um, one of those recording machines, I can't remember what you call them, and yep. talk it and some other guy types it? Like, how does it work? So I've that was my fourth book, and I've written all sorts of different books, right? But I think in general, books, you know, what's what's the length of a good uh, blog post? You know, I don't know, maybe 2,000 words. But for the, the top 10 for, like, guide to SEO, they're probably, like, four or 5,000 words. Uh, books are, generally speaking, in the forty-five to 60,000 word range. Mm -hmm. So most bloggers actually have enough content to write a book. And my first book... You know, I took my blog content, 25% of my book was done, right? <laughs> so I think it comes down to, obviously, what do you want to write about? And if you want to use a book as an inbound marketing tool, it has to be relevant to your business, obviously. Now, if you do a lot of speaking, this is really going to be helpful. Um, or I guess if you do a lot of blogging, if you create a lot of content. So can you create 12 different sub ideas? If I want to teach this one thing, are there 12 or so things or 10 things? Let's do 10 things even easier. Well, no, you know, let's take the 12. There's a reason for 12. Um, <laughs> if there are 12 things that I think are important to teach as part of, you know, for SEO, maybe backlink strategy is one, maybe, you know, on-site SEOs, I, I don't know, right? But if you can create 12 different sort of subtopics and you can write 4,000 words on each one of those subtopics, you now have approximately 50,000 word book, right? Yeah. And you now have, okay, well, I can't, I don't have time to write a 50,000 word book, but I can write a 4,000 word blog post once a week. And then in three months, I'm done with the book. Yeah. So that's the thought. Now I took that one step further. My, my most recent book, I think was my most efficient and my best because I actually did work with a ghostwriter, but not in the way that you're thinking, because I did everything I'm talking about, but for each chapter, because I do a lot of speaking, I created a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And I recorded myself speaking into the PowerPoint and sent that over to the ghostwriter together with blog posts that I already had that I knew would be a good fit into the chapter. So the ghostwriter is able to speak to my voice and it's all my, my content and my insight. Um, and then they were able to do what they do well, which is write compelling copy. So mm -hmm. that process worked out really, really well for me. And, you know, I went to an author marketing conference some time ago. They said 70% of best-selling books are ghostwritten. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget, have you heard of Nielsen? Nielsen ratings, like for TV? Maybe they're not as famous in the UK, but in the US, they're the most famous company for TV ratings. Um, and I'll never forget, you know, hearing firsthand how, you know, one of the VPs there was a very prominent blogger at the company and he blogged 0% of the content. It was all written for him, right? So this this goes on everywhere. <laughs> so I, I don't think you need to be ashamed as long as it's your ideas and you're obviously revoicing it so that you own the content. It's almost mm -hmm. like you know having someone do research for a blog post that then you revoice yeah. and you share it. it. It's the exact same thing, but it's in a book. So this is something any one of you listening, I believe can write a book in three months and because Craig is so awesome and asks these awesome, great questions. He gets the best information out of me. There is a site called Publishizer, publishizer.com. Publishizer is like a Kickstarter for books. So what you do is you put your book idea up there and you can begin to collect money for it, pre-orders for it. Also, publishers will look into Publishizer books. And if you're able to get like 500 pre-orders, you're at the top 1%. You will have publishers reach out to you with offers to publish your book. And you'll have other vendors reach out to you saying, hey, I can help you self-publish your book or whatever it might be. So I did that. And one of the co-founders, Lee Constantine, gonna give him a shout out, he's awesome. I have a YouTube video interview with him where I went through this entire process. But basically I had it up there. I sold hundreds of books pre-sales, right? Even before the book was on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I had an offer, not just, I ended up working with Harper Collins, who's like the biggest business book publisher, but I had an offer from a really good publisher in Holland, in the Netherlands, who says, Hey, Neil, you know, best selling business books in the Netherlands can sell in Dutch can sell 60 or 7,000 copies. We want to translate your book into Dutch first. 
We think it's going to sell better, right? So, you know, when I have another book coming out and I'm already thinking about my next book, maybe I'll do that. But I highly recommend, you know, you spend 50, you don't, and, and that's what Lee told me. He goes, Neil, you don't even have the book written. Think of it as test marketing and a book idea and then send it out to your network, post it on social media and see if people buy, right? And you put together these offers, like buy 10 books, give you free 30 minute coaching, right? Yeah. Um, and then when you get new inquiries, you send them over there. Hey, if you want to work with me, you want me on your podcast, pre-order a book. I'd be more than happy to go on. I mean, you get the idea, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If you want to get a book, I, and you know, with coronavirus right now, I, people were saying, Neil, I feel so sorry for you. you. You published a book right after coronavirus. I think a lot more people are doing a lot more reading right now because they have a lot more time on their hands. So I, I don't think there's a bad time to publish a book. So if you have the idea, I'd go for it. No, that's very interesting, and I will have a look at that. That is a great idea. Um, now, finally, on your own book, uh, The Age of Influence, which anyone can find in the top right-hand corner of your website, which is neilshafer.com. We will have a link below. Um, the book, The Age of Influence, can you just give us a, a bit? I know, obviously, it's, it's going to be about influence and stuff like that, you know, what what else can you give us in terms of what's in there? What would you say to people to encourage them to get that? What are we going to get from it? Yeah, I mean, the way that I look at it is that in digital marketing, you have a few things you can do, right? So everybody has a website. Maybe some people have an app, but you, you need a website. You need a digital you know, front, digital face. Uh, then you obviously need SEO. You need to be found in search engines. And with coronavirus, people are actually doing more searches. So the, there's greater demand for that. You obviously have pay-per-click, which is related to that. As you work your way down, you have email marketing, marketing automation, still extremely important. Got to meet people where they are. Email is still awesome. And then you get into sort of like content marketing, blogging, you know, lead magnets, still critical, right? And then you get into social media, uh, organic and paid. And that's pretty much where people stop. And what I'm saying is, you know, with organic social media, if you're a, if you're a person, the algorithms work in your favor. If you're a business, it you just it's pay to play. And I think most businesses have accepted that fact. But when you pay to play, it's an advertisement, and it's it's intrusive. People, I mean, some ads do very very well. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's still an advertisement, right? Uh, when you what I see now is the sixth sort of type of digital marketing is really saying, hey, instead of paying to play, you know, we're not going to incite this word of mouth marketing that we thought social media would be about. We can only do that when people talk about us. So if you're a Coca-Cola or Virgin Air, you know, BBC, people talk about you on social media. But if you're not that type of brand, how do you do that? And, and you do that through getting people to talk about you, which is really working with influencers, right? You're working with them to incite word of mouth. But as I, that was the original sort of intent of writing the book. But as I did more interviews and research. And as I began speaking about it, I realized, you know, how impactful it can be and how it's not just about leveraging, you know, those Instagrammers and TikTokers, you know, there are influencers that, I mean, like you're an influencer, Craig, right? There are influencers across every social network, across every content medium. And there are influencers that maybe work at your company. Uh, you know, the influencer marketing industry now says if you have a thousand followers, you're a nano influencer. So look around me, look around you. How many people do you know that have a thousand followers, right? How many of your followers have a thousand followers? How many yeah. of your customers have a thousand followers? So you begin to get this very holistic view of digital influence and the fact that, you know what, I may not even have to pay someone to talk about me in social media. And, and Craig, I think that, you know, in B2B and in SEO, people have been doing this for a long time. Hey, Neil. I'd love to offer you a free trial of our, of our service, you know, check it out. Um, would be honored if you do a blog review, but you know, I'd love your feedback. Classic. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 you know, that's, it's not Instagram, it's a blog, but it's influencer marketing. So it's giving away product. It's like giving away product to mommy bloggers, giving away product to Instagrammers. It's the same thing. You're trying to get people to talk about you or link to you or what have you. So I think it's a really powerful concept. And I think once you see, once you read The Age of Influence, hopefully you'll read it, you'll see social media not as a place to just market, but as a place to collaborate with people. And from those collaborations, get tremendous business value. Yeah. We get to the point now where I work with brands. It's like, don't even create your own content. I'm actually presenting on an event in August 
where, you know, how to leverage influencers for hundred percent of your content, podcast mm -hmm. interviews, blog interviews, blog roundups, user generated content on Instagram. You don't even have to create your own content, right? <laughs> and, and UGC user generated content actually performs better. So, and, and, and Craig, there are so many podcasts that are just based on this fact of interviews, right? And not to say that you don't, you don't offer your own views and your own thought leadership content, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's all around us. And it, it kills me when businesses don't realize this, but I'll tell you, you know, I've talked recently about leveraging employees as influencers. I had the CEO of a real estate company reach out to me, read the book. He's like, I, I want every one of our agents to become an influencer. And he's bang on. And yeah. this is something that, you know, if you are insurance sales. So, so anyway, th there's a lot going on in the book. It's not just about influencer marketing. It's also all my views about digital and social. Um, but at the heart of it is this concept of digital influence and how any business in any industry can and should be leveraging it. And can we only get that book on your website or is there other places? Oh, it's everywhere. Amazon, uh, Waterstones, Chapters, Kindle. There's an audiobook version. There's a CD version. So, um, yeah, I, I, had, I had a guy in St. Petersburg in Russia buy it recently. Um, it, it's available globally. So you'll find it. So one final thing, and then I'll let you go because you've given us amazing value. The audiobook side of things, is it actually your voice? So then you have to read that through. The last book I recorded, my publisher at the time was Wiley. They do all the Four Dummies books. And they said, Neil, we can have someone read the book for you. Or if you wanted to read the book yourself, you could. So I opted to read the book myself. I was in a music studio from nine to five, five days straight in order to read the entire book. Now this latest book, I offered to do the same thing. And they said, Neil, we find it's actually cheaper and more effective if we hire a professional. And they actually gave me a choice of professionals who had their own Amazon profiles. Like they had read other books on Amazon. So I found one person who I thought was just way above the rest. He had already like done audiobooks for bestsellers. So you're my guy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's unfortunately not me. If you want to hear my voice, you can hear me on my podcast, but, but I've, <laughs> I've had really, really good feedback on the audiobook version. So no, all good. All good. Um, and finally, if anyone wants to reach out, whether it's for, I know you've got, you do coaching, you do a whole bunch of other stuff. Where is the best place to get you? Well, I'm Neil Schaefer everywhere on social. Uh, that's the real Neil N E A L. And there's a lot of Schaefer's out there in marketing. It's S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R. So Neil Schaefer on social, neilschaefer.com. Uh, at the bookstore, do a search for Neil Schaefer, Age of Influence. You'll probably find it. I also have my own podcast. We'll have to have you on there, Craig, sometime. It's called Maximize Social, Maximize Your Social Influence. So if you're really interested in this concept of digital influence and how you can leverage it for, for marketing, um, that would be a great uh, podcast for you to check out. Yeah, for sure. And you will see the links below, guys, um, when this goes live. But thank you very much for your time, Neil. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and no doubt I will speak to you soon. Oh, thanks, Craig. It's been awesome. Good luck, everybody.